everybody, a warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic platform for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke and I'm excited to be here with Melanie Tonia Evans today. Melanie is a narcissistic abuse recovery expert and she's a best-selling author of You Can Thrive After Narcissistic Abuse. She has also a YouTube channel that has been watched over 15 million times and she has helped thousands of people empower their lives after narcissistic abuse through her online courses. Hello Melanie, how are you today and welcome. Hi Janneke, I'm great and it's, it's wonderful to be here. I'm excited to speak about this because I think it's quite the important topic narcissistic abuse and why I think it's important is that I think many more people are actually experiencing narcissistic abuse that we are aware of and I think perhaps many people feel a bit shameful about speaking about it and actually acknowledging that they have been themselves in a narcissistic relationship, that they have allowed that to happen on some level. And I have some experiences, experience with it myself as well. So I'm really grateful that you have decided to, you know, um, to choose this as your mission in life, to share how we can deal with sort of these kinds of people and how we can break free from a relationship like that. And I know that you have a story, a struggle in your life. Uh, uh, you actually yeah. call it a near-death experience that led you to what Absolutely. you're doing. Yeah. So I would love to hear your journey. Why did you become a narcissistic abuse recovery expert? Yeah, well, Yannicka, first of all, I didn't actually chose it. it. It chose me. So, you know, it was a pretty incredible experience. And I, I don't want to go on too much about my story because I want to make this about everybody else in their recovery. But I, I will say absolutely. And it's a pretty common story. I got to 35 years of age. I'd have did, I had had difficult, painful relationships. I'd done a ton of work on myself and I ended up meeting the man who I thought was the love of my life. He ticked all of my boxes and it just felt so right. It felt like God had rewarded me with this soulmate. So we ended up, uh, to the surprise of my family and friends, after four months we were engaged, we got married very quickly, and there had been warning signs, but I was just so convinced that this was the man of my dreams. It was things I hadn't seen or felt before, and I just thought, no, 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 this will be fine, this will be okay, and I ended up in a marriage where it was incredible amounts of uh, abuse, mental, physical, spiritual, financial, sexual, and I ended up tolerating things that I never believed that I would ever tolerate. And what shocked me to my core um, was that I was so hooked and addicted to this man that I, I found that I couldn't leave him and if I did, he would either love bomb me and get me back or I felt like I was dying without him and I'd get back. And this went off and on for around five years and I ended up being around 80 pounds. I lost all my hair. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I uh, was in therapy at that time and I had post-traumatic stress disorder horrifically. I had agoraphobia, I had fibromyalgia, I had adrenal breakdowns. And I remember at the time that the therapist said to me, she said, because she had seen him for a few sessions and then he departed the therapy and it was only me in there. And she said to me, there's four possibilities for this. And one is, is that either uh, he's going to kill you uh, you're going to kill him or you are going to end up, uh, you, will, you will get a terminal disease because of the stress and the breakdown or you're going to end up with a complete psychotic breakdown uh, if, you, if you stay, if you, if you don't get away and stay away. And at the time I thought, well, I have no idea what a psychotic breakdown means. And anyway, that's exactly what happened. I ended up, Janneke, having a psychotic breakdown and when it happened there was no mistaking it I knew that my mind had snapped and at that time somehow I rang a girlfriend and she came and she got me down to a casualty ward 
And as it turned out, I was diagnosed with a complete psychotic adrenal breakdown. I was told that I would need three antipsychotics to ever function again, that I would never function again as normal. And that night after getting that diagnosis, you see, the thing was I'd always been really capable and able to deal with my life no matter what. And to me, that was worse than a death sentence because I couldn't imagine not being able to function. I really couldn't. And at that stage, I thought, well, my 16-year-old son is better off without me. Um, it would be, uh, he was 15 or 16, I can't quite remember now. But I thought it's better for me to depart. How can, as a single mother, how can he be with me? And I was, I, that night I was on suicide watch and I was contemplating how to kill myself in the kindest way possible to family, friends and him. And there was this voice in my head that, kept screaming at me, no, there's another way. And I thought it was my madness. And I ended up in desperation, getting up, going to the bathroom. I fell on the floor and I put my hands up and I just screamed out, you know, help me. I can't do this anymore. You know, I was checkmate. It was game over. And then an incredible thing happened. It was like my head parted. It was like everything that was the victim, which I was, got sucked out of me and this incredible blinding awareness filled me which was so profound and so crystal clear and maybe um, you have to be out of your mind to actually know the truth. And the truth was, and I saw it with such clarity, that this wasn't about him that he was actually in my life as a symptom of what I'd actually never realised I really needed to heal, which was the aspects of myself that were so hard on me that had always been like that, the parts of me that didn't want to be alone with me and self-soothe and self-support, the parts of me that believed I was never good enough and I had to earn love and approval and in this clarity, I realised that there had been signposts in my life to turn inwards and heal, and I hadn't. I'd done so much work, Yannicka. I'd done psychology, and I'd read every book, and I'd been to every seminar, and I'd been really involved in self development on a spiritual and a practical and a psychological level. But it was this. This awareness was I'd never actually come inside to do the inner trauma work. And then what happened after this awareness, I was catapulted into the future and I had this vision of who I am now, free of trauma, extended, powerful, confident, alive and happy in my body and happy in life. And the bizarre thing was I'd never had those feelings ever. And then the voice said to me, this is who you will be if you choose this mission. And then I was catapulted back into my emaciated, shattered, shaking, decimated, traumatized body. And then the voice said, well, you can leave if you want or you can choose the mission. And I ch chose the mission and I did it with all of my heart because I felt what it felt like. I also had a very strong belief, Yannicka, as a spiritual person, that if I didn't sort this out, I'd have to keep reincarnating, get to the same point, get the same opportunity, hit the same place, and I would be in repeat until I broke through. And I knew that anyway. I just thought it was too much and I couldn't. But then I knew I could. So this really weird thing happened after that. It all I knew it wasn't about him. I knew the keys, the answers, and the emancipation was in with within me. I didn't know what it was, I just knew it was. So the next day I went back to the specialist. I talked my way out of the three antipsychotics, which was beyond belief. Like there was a greater play 
in place, absolutely. And then it started, I never broke no contact again, which was unbelievable because I was so hooked on him, I couldn't get away because I knew it wasn't about him. I still had the trauma, I still had the shattered self. But from that day forward, for the first time in my life, I turned inwards to self-partner, and then it became a profound journey of an 18 months, sometimes millimetre by millimetre uh, journey, and then it, it culminated into this incredible process of finding body modalities, things like EMDR and tapping and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, body code, da, da, da. And eventually that led to 18 months down the track to the channeling and the birth of corner freedom healing, which then became the ability for me in two hours to be able to shift chronic uh, abuse and anxiety trauma conditions that nothing else had shifted. And I was able to shift them and release myself from them. And it, it, that was the beginning of the Thriver Movement uh, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Program, Quantum Freedom Healing, which now, you know, my work has touched over 5 million people worldwide. So, but at the time, I had no idea, Yannicka, that I was, uh, like I said, this chose me. I had no idea that I was going to be doing this as a global recovery quantum energetic expert. I really just thought I was saving my own life. But then what happened is I reached out and other people came and I realized this is such a common thing. And like you said at the start, you hit on a very important thing that a lot of people are in shame. They're incredibly confused. You think because it's projected onto you, it's your fault or you're defective or there's something wrong with you. People say to you, just get over it. Just, just move on. And you can't. You may have always been able to, but this time you can't. And you cannot explain the, the psychic virus and the soul rape that you actually feel. That, quite frankly, is probably worse than, than a physical rape because it's at every level of your being. And not to take any, anything away from anyone who's been raped, of course not, but it but it. You cannot understand unless you've been through it. People don't get it unless they understand it. So you feel very alone, and and I did. But when I started healing it, and I, and then I felt compelled to write some blogs and to, and I was it was incredible. People were coming towards me and they're saying, "You're describing my life word for word. Mm -hmm. Like, are you in my lounge room or you're you in my bedroom?" Because, and then I realized what a worldwide phenomenon this is. And the movement just, I think it was like Louise Hay was saying when she got into her work, all I did was open the mail and reply to it. And really all I did was reply to people and open up healing for others and it actually exploded. Uh, and, and, you know, now it's a global mission in over 120 different countries. We have 18 staff members. It's it's a massive global initial initiative, that, which is the Thriver Movement. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That really touched me. Um, these days I'm practicing embodiment, like staying in my body. And my body was just like responding to so much of what you said, like sadness and shock and um, familiarity, like I recognize things you're yeah. saying. And also I want to say that uh, it is fascinating that this chose you because I think that what we've struggled most with in our lives is often where we have a gift and where we are to help other others. So much. Yeah. So it, it life is so intelligent in that way. And it's and, so easy. Yeah. And how you yeah. discover that it was not about him. It's about you. That's that. I mean, that's really deep. And um, I don't think it's so easy to come there at first because. Oh, gosh. No. Right. You need some. It's a process getting there. Uh, I would love to. Hear I, and look, Janneke, the thing was, you know, if I can just jump in there, the thing was I until I hit in game. 
where there was no nothing left. You see, I'd lost everything. I'd lost all of my resources. I'd lost my contacts. I'd lost my friends. I'd lost my reputation because I was so smeared and destroyed. I virtually had lost my son because he was living with my grandparents because I was just so toxic and crazy, you know. And it wasn't until there were no props and nothing left that I found the truth and I turned inwards. You see, because I was stubborn, I was resilient, I'd always get up and go again. And one of my greatest missions and passions is to help people not have to get to where I got to, which was the razor edge of, of not being able to come back. I totally get what you're saying because I feel that s- some people really uh, hit rock bottom and then their life changes. But that is quite the struggle. You know, I don't think we all need yes, it is. hit rock bottom before we wake up, right? Yeah, so- Nicole, I agree. And I can assure anybody listening, it's not easy coming back from that. You know, I'm a determined, capable, intelligent, hardworking girl that never shied away from a challenge. But I can say it took everything I had. Mm. And, you know, now we have the quantum tools that make it a lot easier, but we can be much kinder and more loving to ourselves to say, why do I need to punish myself to get to that level? Right. I would love to hear more about your technique later on, uh, but let's go into narcissistic relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. What are the common signs or what are like the red flags that we should be really aware of? Because it's often afterwards we discover that, whoa, I've been in a narcissistic relationship. Why didn't I see this? Maybe I did see it, but I, you know, in my subconsciousness. So the red flags. Okay, Yannicka, I love this question. Everybody asks it. But you know what? I believe that your uh, audience is going to be conscious enough because I know the work you do. I want to flip this around a little bit. And I'll preface this by saying you could know logically all the red flags. And I'll tell you what they are. There's somebody who's self-absorbed. There's somebody it's all about them. There's somebody who's never going to take responsibility and they're going to dodge accountability. And if you confront them with something, they're going to twist and turn things and you're going to feel like your head is spinning and you're arguing with a five-year-old in an adult's body. But, Yannicka, that is only down the track right? You're only going to see that when you're in the relationship. So the fact is the red flags is there is no narcissist who's going to walk up to you with a t-shirt on saying, I'm a narcissist, right? The only, they're in fact, they're very clever. They know how to mind people and they know how to appeal to you to win your confidence. So we may say the saying, you know, too good to be true, this person is too nice, but there are beautiful, nice, open-hearted people that are genuine people. So it's really not great to go around with your defence mechanisms to go, well, they're nice, Maybe they're a narcissist, maybe they're a narcissist, they're charming, they're attractive, they're into me, they're interested, maybe they're a narcissist. No, you know my current partner who's beautiful, he's a life partner, he was very attentive, very romantic, beautiful man, but definitely not a narcissist. So I want everybody to understand this. What are the warning signs? You're not going to get them till it's too late. So what does that mean? It means it's not who they're being that's important. It's who you are being that's important. And I'll explain it to you in very... Oh, I think that was my kitten. Is that the thing on the shelf? Okay, I've got new kittens. They're just so gorgeous. Okay, so let's say you're on a date, okay? A narcissist will be interested in you because really what they're doing is they're trying to find out what you have missing or what's hurt you because if they work out what's missing in your life or what has hurt you and they pretend to be the remedy to it, if they want you as narcissistic supply, 
all they have to do is pretend with full purported sincerity that they're going to fix it for you. So let's say they were to say, well, what's happened in your previous relationships? And you say, well, Mark, you know, look, I... <laughs> My ex played up on me and then Mark could look you straight in the eyes, start mimicking your body language. He'd say, oh, I don't even understand how anybody could be like that. I am full on monogamous. It's always been a really strong value for me. I could never play up on anybody. That's just not who I am. Right. Now, he could be lying his backside off looking you straight in the eye and he he's he's now the thing is how what you want to say when you've done the inner work and you're an empowered woman what happens is if you're on a date and they say well you know what happened in your previous relationships how you would answer that is you would say well you know I went through some challenges and I had infidelity but you know what it's so great because I've used those opportunities to heal me. I know what I'm looking for. I'm ready to take my time to get to know people. I've loved being single. And, you know, it, it was a blessing in disguise for me because I learned and healed so much about myself. Now, when you say that to a narcissist on a date, you wait and see and watch their head spin. Because they're like, oh, my God, here is somebody with good boundaries, great self-awareness. I can't pretend to be the saviour of their wounds and rush right in and sweep them off their feet. Because what a narcissist wants to do, wants to hook you very quickly, wants you to open up your heart, your mind, your body, your home, your finances very fast. And if you are working on yourself and you're really invested in your self-development, you know that you're not just going to fall for chemistry. You're not just going to go for love at first sight. You're not going to be wooed and love bombed. You're not a broken child seeking metaphorically an adult to fix your wounds, which narcissists love to pretend to be. You're a solid woman or man in your body taking your time getting to know somebody's character. So, for example, you know, my partner in my life, we dated for three months without sex platonically to get to know each other's character and values to see if we would be applicable life partners for each other. And what a beautiful, courting, respectful process that was. And then, you know, now if you're that, I can assure you no narcissist is going to hang around for that because they can't hit, they can't enmesh, and they can't start extracting narcissistic supply. You've got to think parasite. What does a parasite do? Hook into a host and start sucking, and that's what narcissists do because they're an empty no self. They have to. So if, and I, you know, when I was dating, Absolutely. There was times I was on dates with narcissists and it was so great because I was me. I would see the head spin. I remember one time I was on a date with a narcissist and third date, you know, I'm taking my time and yes, he was gorgeous. He had a great job. He was intelligent. He was funny and I'm getting to know his character, right? And I'm not falling into bed with him. So we were out at dinner and he'd let his guard down because nobody can keep up a mask indefinitely. And he was starting to be really nasty about people at work. And I went to the ladies, I came back and he said, you know, all cocky, so how do you think we're going on our third date? This is really great. And I showed up. I said to him, well, honestly, you know, it really doesn't resonate or gel with me how you're being so disparaging about people at work. I was honest. It was on my heart. It was my truth. He blew up right in front of me. He was like, how dare you speak to me like that? You know, I'm on a date with you and you're so... And I just sat back and I watched the narcissist just explode in front of me. Why? Because I called him out with truth. 
And he said to me, the date's over. And I said, that's fine. Do you want me to pick up the bill? Or, And he goes, no, I'll pick it up. And I said, no, no, on the way out, I'll pay for mine. That's fine. So I just got up, paid for mine, walked to my car. I was punching the air. I was so excited, <laughs> so empowered. I'm like, this is so cool. You have stood up. You said what was on your heart and your intuition and your truth. You just said it how it was. No excuses, no justifying, no worrying about his feelings, no worrying about his reactions. And look at what I saved myself from going through. Hmm. You know, in the past, I would have gone to the ladies and thought, oh, that was a bit nasty. Oh, but he's so cute and he's really successful and he's funny and he's intelligent. So this is what I'm saying. I flushed him out in three dates. I've had narcissists on dates that have tried to find my gap and my insecurity and what needs fixing, and I'm just showing up as an empowered woman. And I remember one of them, and he said to me, he's like, oh, well, I'm into self-development too, you know, because he had no rest to go. And I said, great, tell me, who have you studied? What books have you read? There was none. (laughs) He was called out, right? Mm. So what I'm saying is do not read up at all the signs and go. If you go out and you have the trauma on you because you haven't done the work on yourself trying to find a narcissist, you're going to be a paranoid person full of defences, you're not free to be yourself and you're going to be so fearful. Now, what happens when we're fearing something and we haven't healed that fear and empowered ourselves and had the graduation? You're either going to keep attracting these people and then your mind, if your love code, if you haven't done the work, means the people I love hurt me, abuse me, leave me, reject me, abandon me, punish me, annihilate me, cheat on me, that's your love code. If you haven't done the inner work, As scared as you are, you're going to make excuses. The mind follows the body. You're going to talk yourself into a relationship with people like that over and over again. In my community, because I've worked with so many hundreds of thousands of people over the last 12 years, I know so many people that haven't done the inner work. It doesn't matter how much they learn and how much of an expert they are, they keep repeating the same patterns, and I used to too. Thank you Until so I realized the truth. Thank you so much for it's talking about It's not about us. them, it's about us. Sorry? It's not about them. It's mm. about developing and healing us. I, I loved how you explained it so thoroughly uh, because it makes so much sense what you're saying. So much sense. Yeah. Because it can be a bit uh, superficial to speak about the red flags in a relationship. And it's yeah. all about you. Uh, it makes and by the time you see them and your brain will comprehend them because we want the fantasy we will the little things will just you know the funny look or that weird feeling or you go oh no I was mistaken and by the time it is that obvious and the writing's on the wall it's too late you're trapped you're hooked you're trauma bonded you're addicted what I am curious about is these narcissistic people. Uh, you might have uh, thought about this or contemplated on this. Yeah. Can they change? Where? Why do you think they are like they are? Is it yeah. lack of self-love? Is it big traumas? Like, I'm curious about that syndrome or, or way of being or, or sure. what we call it, a disease. What would we call it? Is it a big, big trauma that can't be changed in that person or yes? It's such a great question, Yannicka, and it's one that's on everybody's heart and what everybody wants to know. Okay, so this is the thing. It can be nature or it can be nurture, and I've seen so much evidence of this. So we have to understand that the genetic composition of ancestors, etc can be passed on, just like eye colour, hair colour, skin colour. So I really do believe it's sad, but it is. There are some people that are narcissistic from birth, okay? So what that means is the trauma that they have, the amygdala, the back of their brain is overdeveloped, they they come on board with defence mechanisms. 
usually into a family where those defense mechanisms are very, very required. So they've come from uh, narcissistic parents and narcissistic backgrounds and the genetic history. So what that means is, and these are the defenses, this is ego, this is survival, it's me against you. I need these defense mechanisms and I'm constantly triggered and I need to fight for my emotional survival. So it can be brought in. Absolutely, it can be through a trauma within the experience which has led a person who was narcissistic to say, well, my true self, who I am, can't get its needs met. It's not functional. I'm either not uh, valid, uh, I'm not safe, I'm going to be annihilated. So what I need to do is bury that, divorce that, and literally kill it off and put in a fictitious false self in its place, which is the buffer. And that buffer is, you know, I'm superior, I'm omnipotent, I'm all-powerful, you know. So, and this false self is a pathological self. And what does a pathological self do? It lies, it manipulates, it controls, it's a means to an end. And because it's not a true self, it means it's not connected to self, source, others and life so that whole oneness which is our higher being our super conscious our 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 higher potential self call it god creation life force the universe whatever you want to call it you know that's true source that's where we get that connection of knowing that we're loved and adored beyond measure because we exist when we come home to ourselves and source you know that is the ability to have peace and wholeness and inner solidness, and which, by the way, is our return home recovery after narcissistic abuse. But the problem is with a narcissist is you have to be able to hold and heal the true self, release the trauma, and create the space for source to enter, to embody who we really are. Now, for a narcissist, to turn inwards and pick up the true self that's catatonic, that's discarded and disowned and divorced and covered over by the false persona would mean that they have to get humble, they have to get real, and they have to let go of that buffer and that defence mechanism. And by the very... They call it wetico, and I believe that, you know, it's the psychic virus, the ego run amok, the, the false self. To let go of that to a narcissist feels like a literal emotional, spiritual annihilation because the true self feels like it's going to an self-annihilate. So they won't do it. The only time that a narcissist will do it is an extreme narcissistic injury. Let's just say that 20 things in their life have imploded, which can happen, and so much uh, shock has happened that the false self has no energy to hold itself up as, as the delusion and illusion, and the narcissist is left with nothing but the true self. And it is at that time you will see the broken child in the corner in humility and honesty. But the moment, and they can act that, that can be an act, that can be a fiction as well. But if it's for real, the moment that they get any energy, they get any attention, they get any narcissistic supply to to hit the button of the defences, they will go up again and it's back to narcissistic business as usual. And that moment's gone. So what I've discovered in my work is that it's interesting. I've had narcissists come forward over the last 12 years. I even in the early days worked with three of them to see and prove to myself. Do they is, know that they are narcissists th themselves? Absolutely. In that moment, absolutely. And a lot of them do. A lot of them do. And absolutely. And they owned up to it. And they actually shared with me. It was really great. I would never work with a narcissist again, by the way, because as soon as they get any energy, 
it's it, the defenses are up and and forget it. But what I had shared with me was some of the most. It was an incredible journey into the mechanics, the machinations of the mind of a narcissist, and how distorted and disordered the thinking is. So for a narcissist, certain behaviours are fair game because you threatened or uh, went against the false self who is a conscienceless uh, punisher without any compassion, you know, and I could tell you the stories, but to put it very simply, one story kind of sums it all up, how he had a girlfriend who didn't show him enough attention and her cat, you know, one day he was out, he beat it to death, put it in a garbage can and said it went missing and this was his way of punishing her back for not meeting him at the door to greet him. And to the narcissistic narrative, that's fair game. That's that's just what you do, you know. And to me, you know, after the session, I went and scrubbed myself with a brush because I'm an animal lover and it just made me sick to my soul. But to them, that's how they think. And they hide that from other people because they know that we can't tolerate that and the, and the, the gig would be up. The jig would be up. We'd be on to them if, if they were honest about that. So, and this is pretty stock standard and we don't realise it. So, you know, really what's happened is these people have divorced from their true self, they've divorced from their soul, they've run amok by, you can call it an AI, you can call it uh, evil, you could call it the opposite of light, the opposite of God. You could call it satanic if you wanted, mm. you know, but they really have sold their soul to the dark side and that's what ego is. Ego run amok is that and that's where they're operating and and who they are, you know, every, yeah. Mm. Wow, well, I'm learning so much. Uh, wow. And I'm <laughs> so much is going on in my head and, like, I'm, I'm actually thinking about other girlfriend's relationships right now that I'm recognizing has been a narcissistic relationship. I bet. So it's, it's I know I'm going to send funny. this interview around to some few people. Uh, I want to ask you, do you have any advice on how we can get out of a relationship? Okay, once we're there, what can we do? Well, I would just say to people, you know, and I'm such a purist for my work because it is about solution. And a lot of people are, just learn all about narcissists. No, that's not going to help you. You know, what we need to do is come back home in a way that you can get your sanity, your soul and your life back. And that's what my work is all about. So, you know, look, it's a big, big conversation, but initially, and it's hard because the logic is going to really dick and mess with you because it's been so twisted and turned and you've been gaslighted, right, and you've been told it's your fault and you're going to be questioning your own sanity. You've hit helplessness, hopelessness because you're being soul harvested. This is a big, big psychic phenomena that's going on and a lot of people get away from narcissists and you feel like you're dying, you feel like they're walking through you, that you've got black ink permeating you. There's so much soul shock going on and, you know, I feel very blessed that I can talk about that from experience because I went through it and there's never a day I'll forget what that felt like. I don't have the trauma of it, but I absolutely, I have the memory without the triggers and the trauma. I'm completely clear from that, but I'll never forget what that felt like. So I understand what people go like and people will say to you, well, do this or do that or do the other. It's not that simple. However, when you understand how to heal this properly, you know, and I offer a lot of free resources. Like I have a free 16-day course. I have a free webinar. That's a two-hour where people can actually go through a cleansing healing to start getting your life, your soul, and your sanity back. But it is the deeper inner work at the psychic soul level that is necessary to reclaim you. The great news is that if you get on that path and on your track, 
on the track with that and and the support which my community is just so big and strong with. We have thousands of people and moderators and thrivers and, and as a global community to help hold you in that. When you start that, it literally can be within days and weeks that you're getting massive relief and power and soul energy back. But what I've found over the years and with myself and with other people, if you just research narcissists, if you just do talk therapy, if you try to do it at a mind level, it's it's really extremely ineffectual to recover. It has to be deeper and more powerful. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, can you share a little bit about your technique? Because I, I know, like you've been saying, that you've helped so many people and quantum healing. I'm curious about what it actually is. Yeah. It, is it like, you know, the uh, meditation going into your body, like uh, changing things on a subconscious level? Is that what you mean? I'm just curious if you can share a little bit more about sure, your technique. Sure. And that's part of it. It really is, you know. And, and look, my training and my background, I'd always been kind of like a spiritual healer. I'd been a past life regression therapist for two decades before this happened to me. So I already had, you know, I was like a, I, I was like a Reiki too and, you know, all sorts of other things. But this journey led me into kinesiology and it led me into being able to access deep past life traumas, uh, and then I actually developed what was known as and cedar healing and all sorts of things. So, okay, so to put it simply, um, Janika, how it really works is it's accessing the emotional body, the past life body, the genetic body, and also to the multidimensional bodies, being able to draw out the trauma literally out of the cells and your DNA to pick up those traumas on any particular belief or trauma that you're working on, load it up, release it up and out of you cellularly, and then within that, that clear that space to be able to bring in the source healing and resolution on that, which is your highest potential coded truth, which is your true self, which is your source God self and bring that in to shift what was there and when that happens you reset back to your organic true coded self on any topic in your life and if you keep doing that and you know how to do that and you know how to untangle I have a 10-step process in my Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Program, which is all of this stuff. When you know exactly as I worked out for myself and over the last 12 years, this is the third version of this program, exactly where our gaps, our hooks and our insecurities are that have created this, when you know how to unravel that and heal that piece by piece energetically powerfully at a DNA level from the inside out, you emerge from this not just completely free from the abuser because you're now graduated to a much higher frequency, free from the patterns of continuing that in your life again and having access to higher, more true self, true life trajectories that will completely gratify you. Mm. So that's what the program does. It sounds amazing. Uh, I get very curious about it. Uh, what was sort of the change? Because I know that you said, like you've been working on yourself, you've been a healer, Reiki, doing all these things. Yeah. And you experienced this narcissistic abuse and then you found yeah. your true healing what was sort of the difference yes. i mean you did speak a bit about it but i'm curious about what the difference was to what you were doing with your spiritual work before because i hear this many yeah. times that people are like but i've been on the spiritual journey for 20 years it's and a perfect it's question Yanika. <laughs> it really is a perfect question well you know what the truth was because i could always get up and get on with my life again these things that I were doing, 
I was never really embodying them and applying them. I thought I was, but I wasn't. And I didn't need to. I wasn't brought to a point where it was game over if I didn't. So, you know, I could have a Reiki or a past life regression and that's really interesting and that's really cool and I get why I did that and why I should do this, but I hadn't really learnt the truth. And the truth that I know now is that if we have trauma and belief systems and lesson patterns existing in our subconscious, if we don't really shift them and reprogram them, then we're going to continue to do the same stuff, Hmm. no matter what we know. Hmm. That's the piece I hadn't got. Hmm. And I didn't have tools that were really powerful enough to do that. You know, past life regression was great. It gave information and it gave a bit of a shift. And Reiki was good. You know, it could settle some anxiety, but it wasn't shifting deep trauma programs. Okay. Kinesiology was a really great start for me, especially when you got into the ancient kinesiology that could really access past life, deep uh, genetic and survival program trauma. That made a big difference. But what, so I started putting together past timeline therapy and kinesiology, and I called it holographic healing, and it was making them, and the best healings were the ones I were doing on myself, you know, because I, I just, I've always been in numerology and stuff, and I had really good, humbly, natural ability as a healer. I found my own healings on myself were more powerful than what anybody else could do. But I still had agoraphobia. In other words, I could get out in open spaces and I'd feel like my world was going to crush me. It was, I'd never had it until a horrific, very vengeful, nasty narcissist who I was married to who wanted to kill me. And, and, you know, he nearly killed the next person on from me. He was a very dangerous man. So this was fully activated in my system. And then what happened was I had tried every healer and every therapy and everything. I could research on agoraphobia and I knew from the quantum level and how far I'd come and learned and, and it, everything I'd done, you know, I had already healed the unhealable. My brain damage was gone. My PTSD was completely gone in safe spaces. You know, I, in so many ways, I felt more, ca- I'd lost everything, but I felt happier and more one than I ever have. But in open, unknown spaces, agoraphobia would hit. So what happened was I said, in, I knew that if I could find the causation trauma, the past life trauma and the beliefs, I'm not safe in life. If I could find the root of those in my DNA, load it up, release it and bring in source, I knew it would be instantly healed Mm. because I'd done it with so many things, but I couldn't get to it. And then what happened was I set an intention one day, I was over it. And I, it was amazing because I went on a trip to Thailand. I had agoraphobia. I didn't even know how I got there. It was so traumatizing for me. It was horrific. Fell into my girlfriend's arms, got into the hotel premises, and within two days it was a safe space. I was having an awesome time, but I wanted to get out and coast a million experience, and I knew I couldn't. With agoraphobia, it would be horrific. So I'm in my hotel room. She's out doing her thing, and I thought, this is it. This is it. I'm going to find the answer. And I put it up there and I said, you know, I'm just going to open my my mind, my heart, my soul. Give me the answer. And I started channeling and I'm writing and I'm journaling. And as I'm journaling, I'm like I'm shaking with excitement because it was kinesiology, it was past life time therapy. It was things I'd, I'd never heard or known yet. But yet as I was writing it, I knew I already knew it. And I'm writing it and I'm like, this is it. And I did it for two hours on myself. I didn't, I hadn't called it quantum freedom healing yet. And as I was doing it on myself, I found things and traumas and beliefs and I loaded them up and I let them go and I brought in source and then I walked out the front gate of the resort into the whole busy street of Koh Samui and I'm just like, 
playing and jiving in life more than I ever have. And it was interesting because in that healing, I realized I'd always been agoraphobic. I'd always been a little girl behind my mum's skirts, always. But, you know, he, the abuser in my life, the husband had just smashed what was already there and made it fully conscious. So I'd cleansed all that. And I was like, you know what, I'm high-fiving people and I'm dancing in the streets and I'm talking to everybody and I go to some movies crazy, you know. And I'm just like, oh, my God. And then I got back and my girlfriend's like, I've got all these bags and stuff I've bought and, you know, I'm buying stuff I didn't even need to buy. I was just so happy. And I've got back and she's like, you haven't been out there. And I'm like, she goes, what happened to you? And I said, I found the key. I just... And that was it. I was done. And I'd had agoraphobia for lifetimes because I'd been smashed. I'd been annihilated. It wasn't safe to be a woman in life. It wasn't safe to be myself. I'd been annihilated. And all of that came up in the healing and it all got cleansed and I was free. And when I got back to Melbourne, because I was already doing holographic healing on a whole heap of people, you know, I said, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing this. And then what happened was, you know, I had clients and then what happened was a lot of them were from like they were narcissistic abuse people that had like DV workers working with them and psychologists and therapists and all sorts of things. These people started ringing me up and they said, what have you done to my patient and my client because they walked in here a completely different person? What has happened? So all this attention came on this and before I knew it, it blew out. I was booked up three months in advance. I had people from all over the world contacting me and emailing me. And I'm like, I need to create a program because I can't just do this myself. And that was how Quantum Freedom Healing was born and how the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery was born program, which now is through 120 different countries and doctors and psychologists and therapists from all over the world recommend it because it, it just shifted people. And that is a program that uh, we can find on your website, right? So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Wow. Wow. Absolutely. This has been so yeah. interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure. Look, it's a crazy story. And, you know, like before this happened to me, I wouldn't have believed it was possible. I had no idea, you know, and I was spiritual and I was into everything. And, you know, I just feel so blessed that this happened for me and, and for others. I feel so blessed. I wouldn't change a thing. And that's amazing that you're saying because it just shows how far you've come. And I, I'm just thinking that, you know, I've interviewed so many people and, uh, uh, I see this red thread uh, and it what you're saying really fits into what other people are saying even though they have different perspectives and different experiences you had that sort of uh, experience that made you come to that realization but that realization Absolutely. is that realization I hear again and again that if we don't heal what's inside, we repeat the same things. And it was the narcissist that showed that to you. For other people, it's other things that they keep on attracting. And it comes back to that healing again and again. And it comes back to yeah. those core yeah. wounds that we need to become aware of in ourselves. Uh, yes. So I, I just, and we yeah. think, and we think, Janika, that we're getting free from that person or that thing. Or, yeah. But really... What we've been getting free from is our own limitations and false trauma programming. That was never who we really are. You know, it was impregnated through life or our genetics or our experiences, our emotional experience, but it's not our true self. It's all an imposter. And when we just face that and let it go and bring in our true self and then really get determined to show up in authentic ways, like I was saying, you know, when you're out dating, when you can be authentically, mm. unapologetic, unapologetically yourself in your own skin through right action and integrity, all of life supports you. And if you piss off a few people and if you're able to risk being criticised, rejected, abandoned or punished for being yourself as an adult, I call it the fear of crap. When you get past that, you are truly free. 
That and people are either going to step up and meet you at integrity or they're going to move out of your space. And you will start to create a life that is your true life. That was so powerful and so helpful and important. And I think every love coach should just include that in their teaching. You know what you were saying there? Because it's super, super important. It all starts there. It all starts with you know, being in your body, yeah. having your boundaries. Yeah not expressing yeah. who you are. I love it. And and it is yeah. not... And there's been so much shit around women, yeah, right? Yeah, I was just thinking it's about like it. It's our past. So much. Yeah. You know, we've been so believed, you know, we're too much of this mm. and we're not enough of that and we've just got to show up in ways where we're going to be chosen and we're going to please somebody. You know, beautiful men. And I really hate that whole... You know, because I don't want women to be feminists. I'm actually really against the modern feminist movement because it so emasculates men and it masculizes us, which is so unattractive. You know, you can be a beautiful feminine woman who, you know, I'm very feminine, but I value myself and I'm going to be honest and integrity and, you know, I have in my life a very masculine man who's in his heart, but I love that he gets a drink for me. I love that if I've had a hard day, I can burst into tears and he will hug me. But the difference, the, the difference is I learned to be my own lover, supporter, and, 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 and beautiful healer, which is now why... I have that in my life. Mm. Mm, right. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. We're going to wrap up. But is there any last words of wisdom you would like to share today? I Well, there's so much. But to wrap it up, you know, I'll just say this. I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, I know what it feels like to think I've lost too much. I'm too old, I'm too heartbroken, you know, I'm too defective, I'm, I'm too broken that I can never heal. I, I just want you to know virtually everybody that's been through narcissistic abuse, you feel like that. You feel like there's nothing. But I promise you from that nothing, from that end of the line, from your greatest darkness is your greatest gold to mine. And this is what I am so passionate about and this is what, you know, I want everybody to know. So look up my stuff and you, that it's my mission to help you get there. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Melanie. It's so my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching, everybody. Much light from Australia and Norway. Bye-bye. Yeah.